Hi, my name is Nigel Cohen. Uh, I'm presenting the Sunshine Courses Accounting module. This module is on fixed assets. And what we're going to be covering is the principles of what fixed assets are, the basis of how those costs are allocated over the life of the asset, the accounting entries that put into practice that allocation, uh, the reporting, particularly statutory reporting, and then we're going to cover a few practical tips. So the principle of fixed assets is that we spend money on buying assets that last typically a lot more than a year. Technically, they only need to last a year or more to be uh, term, uh, described as fixed assets. But we go out and spend money on uh, equipment such as a car or a property. And in the example we're gonna be showing uh, in this uh, module, um, we're going to be looking at the shop fittings that a retailer, clothes retailer would buy in order to, to display clothes. So that cost lasts for three, four, five years, depending on the asset. If it's a car, typically it lasts for two, three, four years. Um, uh, if it's uh, fixtures, uh, a retailer will typically have them for about five years and then they'll need to renew them or replace them. And if you're talking about, for example, a building, sometimes the length of the asset can last for 10, 15, 20, 50 years sometimes. So during this session, we're going to be specifically looking at uh, how we account for fixed assets, uh, the purchase of shop fittings, which cost 120,000 pounds, and those assets last five years. So remember the reason we're doing this in the first place is that we need to match our costs against our revenues. Now, whilst we've got the fittings, we're gonna get people coming into the shop over whatever the life of the assets are, but in this case, we're just gonna assume it's five year period. And during that five year period, we're going to receive uh, revenues from the sale of those, uh, of the clothes that are on the fittings. And the fittings create ambiance in the store, as well as providing the opportunity for people to physically get the stock and to take it and to buy it. So those costs of 120,000 pounds last for a five year period. So the question is, how do we account for the apportionment of the cost? And how do we allocate it in the accounts? How do we mechanically put the adjustments through to effect what we need to do? Well, in the example we've got here, year zero, remember, is the accounting way that we talk about the start of any accounting period. And then the rest of the columns are what happens in year one, then year two, then year three, and so on. And right at the very, very beginning of this period, we spend 120,000 pounds to buy these assets. And in this particular example, we're going to allocate the cost equally over a five year period. So the way we simply do that is to divide the 120,000 pounds by five, which is 24,000 pounds. And each year we're going to allocate that to the accounts to reduce that 120,000 pounds over the five year period down to zero. So remember the mechanism of what we're doing is we're taking the 120,000 pounds and we're spreading it so that it matches the cost of that 120,000 pounds matches the revenues that relate to it. In this case, we're saying it's 24,000 pounds each year. And this little table is a typical format for quite a lot of accounting, but in particular, uh, managing fixed assets. And in year one, it shows that we start at the beginning of the year with 120,000 pounds, which is what we bought in year zero or at the beginning of the period. We then allocate depreciation of 24,000 pounds and left with 96,000 pounds. And in year two, we start the year with 96,000 pounds, which was the figure from the, some, the bottom of year one. And if you look at the overall totals, 
the totals at the end of year five, just for this asset alone, show that we start off with nothing, we spent £120,000, we depreciated over that five year period, the whole of the £120,000. So we're left with nothing, which is what the running total shows us. Okay, so that's relatively easy. The question then simply would be, how do we put that through the account? And we'll show that in just a minute. But I want to go to a spreadsheet now, because I want to highlight something that's uh, slightly, uh, that's slightly um, uh, um, subtle. Okay, so hopefully you can see the spreadsheet. The top part of the spreadsheet it, spreadsheet is exactly what was in the slideshow just now and it's what we call the fixed rate uh, apportionment of the costs and as I said we've allocated £24,000 each year because we know that we're getting revenues over that five-year period so it's quite right to apportion the cost of £24,000 each year for each of the five years but remember what we're doing we're allocating the cost to the revenues that it relate to. And in a simple example, it's fairly straightforward. But what happens if we have to spend increasing amounts of money on keeping that racking alive? Because after the first year, it's in pretty good shape. But as it gets worn, as it's more and more used, more people bash against it, and we have to spend more and more money on repairing the uh, racking, it's actually arguable that the overall cost of the racking is not just the purchase price of 120,000, but also the maintenance costs. Yet those maintenance costs don't come equally throughout the period. They start off very low and they grow. And this is a very typical pattern. If, for example, you've got a car, the same thing happens with a car, which is much more obvious in terms of the costs, that the longer you have a car, the more it costs to run. So there's an alternative concept of allocating the costs. Instead of allocating them on an annual basis fixed based on the 120,000 pounds, it says, let's allocate the depreciation, not by reference to the cost, but by reference to how much we've got left in the balance sheet at the end of the period. So I'm gonna illustrate what I mean by that. At the end of the first year, we start off the year with £120,000. As with the fixed rate, we apportion 20% of that cost. At the end of the first year, we're down to £96,000 left. So at the start of year two, we've got £96,000. Only this time, we're going to take 20% not of the cost of £120,000, but on the balance at the beginning of the period. So instead of having £24,000, we have £19,000. And if you look at the depreciation, if we do this throughout the period, in the fixed rate, it stays constant throughout the period at 24,000 a year. But in the reducing balance basis, it decreases each year, which some people and in some businesses would be more appropriate if the other side of depreciation is, for example, maintenance costs. And then what you're doing with this using the reducing balance basis is you're apportioning the cost on a fairer way against the revenues, so that if you have a fixed amount of sales every year, you're gonna get a much more even spread of costs. And that reflects the reality in some businesses better. So imagine you've got, remember we're talking about costs of 24,000 pounds. Imagine you've got revenues of 30,000 pounds. In the first example, you'll have net revenues of 6,000 pounds a year. That's 30,000 revenue less 24,000 pounds of depreciation. depreciation. That's the 6,000 pounds. In the first year, you'll have hardly any maintenance costs, but in year five, you might have the whole of 6,000 pounds of maintenance costs. So what you could have is profits in the first year of 6,000 pounds going down to profits of nil in the fifth year, not because trading has changed, but just because you have apportioned depreciation too fast relative to the maintenance costs. So the reducing balance basis is more appropriate for businesses where they increase the amount they have to spend on the asset 
as the asset gets older, and the purpose is to even out the cost more fairly over the life of the asset. The nice thing as the accountant is you have the choice of what you can, what you do. We talk about this as being an accounting policy. Our accounting policy for fixed assets is either the fixed rate basis or the reducing balance basis. And if you talk to an investor about the different basis that you've got, just by describing it as a fixed rate or reducing balance, they will understand what you mean and how the fixed assets are accounted for, and they'll be able to make adjustments if they need to, if, for example, they're comparing these accounts with the accounts of somebody else. So all we're talking about at the moment is how much we put in the profit and loss account relating to, to depreciation each year. So I want to show you how what that looks like in the accounts themselves by illustrating with the trial balance. And for the trial balance, I've got accounts for the years to 31st of December 21, 22, and 23. So that's the first three years of the chart we had. And in this example, I'm using the fixed rate basis of depreciation. So the XX is, is simply implies that there's a lot of other transactions going on in the annual transactions. But one of the transactions is that we bought 120,000 pounds of shop fittings. There'll be a lot of other transactions that are going on. So this eventually would equal zero, even though at the moment it shows 120,000, um, if we showed the full transactions. I'm just showing the extract relating to the fixed assets. So we bought 120,000 pounds of assets. In the first year, we depreciated it by 24,000 pounds, and we're left with 96,000 pounds. So the entries were reducing the asset it's the opposite of a debit, debt or a debit, it's a credit. We credit fixed assets and we debit depreciation in a profit and loss account. So the depreciation reduces the profits we make because we're allocating that cost against the sales that relates to that cost. And at the end of the first year, we've got 96,000 pounds. In the second year, because we've got the fixed uh, the fixed rate basis, we do exactly the same thing. We've got the 24,000 pounds we put a journal through. Notice the audit trail. The audit trail probably takes you back to this calculation. And you'll see the second year, we apportioned 24,000 pounds, 24,000 pounds in here, same accounting journal. Credit fixed assets because we're reducing the fixed assets and we debit depreciation. Again, we're allocating 24,000 pounds of the original cost in this year to the sales in this year because the fixed assets are being used during the year. And so on the same thing with the third year and at the end of the third year, our account show we have 48,000 pounds. Let's just double check that against the chart. The end of the third year, 48,000 pounds, great. What this shows is how we implement this depreciation. And I just want to show if we instead replace this basis with the reducing balance basis. So this time I'm going to use the chart from the reducing balance basis in the trial balance. The first year is still 24,000 pounds, but in the second year, I'm going to pick up the 19,200 pounds. So look, the, the journal entry this time is minus 19,200 pounds. We credit profits 19,200 pounds, debit depreciation 19,200 pounds. And again, in the third year, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm gonna pick up the depreciation in the third year, which is 15,360 pounds, credit fixed assets, debit profit and loss account. And in this way, we've reduced the cost of shop fittings that we carrying forward to future years to 61,440. Going back to the calculation, that sh the chart shows we've still got a balance carried forward of 61,440. So our accounts are correct. This is the unallocated fixed asset cost. And we've allocated of the 120,000, we've allocated 58,000 pounds to depreciation. So can you see this cost here after three years, has the balance is reduced to 61,000 because we've allocated costs over the three year period on the reducing balance basis of 58,000 pounds. 
And I'm just going to show what that looks like in the nominal ledger. So if you're entering using computerized accounts, we would enter these depreciation each year as a journal. And in the nominal ledger for shop fitting costs, we show we bought the shop fittings of 120,000 pounds. At the end of the first year, we put the journal through to reduce, put through the 24,000 pounds that reduces the cumulative balance from 120,000 pounds to 96,000 pounds. Depreci depreciation for the second year is 19,200. For the third year, 23,000, uh, 15,360. And at the end of the third year, our uh, nominal ledger or a general ledger, our account for sh shop fitting costs shows a net cumulative balance of 61,440 pounds. That's what the computer would show. But if we're doing this with um, uh, the reducing balance, when it comes to doing using the computer, it's quite easy to get the calculation of what depreciation should be, because it's always based on what this cumulative balance is. And it's very easy to do the calculation. The calculation, the shortcut calculation for depreciation is simply 20% of the previous year's net book values. But if this wasn't the reducing balance, if this was the fixed basis, so imagine this now showed minus 24,000 pounds again. When we're doing the shortcut for years two or years three, it's not so easy to remember how you calculate 24,000 pounds, because you've got to remember that the cost was 120,000 pounds. But so, so the there's a, a when we're doing the um, when we're doing the fixed rate basis of accounting, there's a different way that we do the accounting for it, and we actually set up two separate nominal accounts. One nominal account is just for the cost itself, and the other nominal account is for the depreciation. They both go within fixed assets. So they're both in the fixed assets section. But here, when we put through our purchase, we, our journal, we put through, uh, we credited bank or however we paid for it, we reduced the asset and we debited the fixed asset, which is shop fitting costs. Then at the end of the first year, instead of putting the pre depreciation through to the, to the shop fittings cost account, we put it through to the shop fittings accumulated depreciation account. Same thing in the second year, same thing in the third year. And the reason this then becomes very easy is if you want to calculate a shortcut way of calculating depreciation, you can simply look at the total cumulative balance on your ship shop fitting costs of the year and multiply it by 20% or whatever your depreciation rate is. And it's very easy to calculate the depreciation. And once again, the cumulative balance on the, the nominal cost and the cumulative balance on the depreciation, if you net the two off together, Give you the correct trial balance figure. So final thing I just want to mention is how you show this in the statutory accounts. And in the statutory accounts, there's a traditional format. You show the previous year in the following column and the current year is in the first column. And for various reasons in the statutory accounts, we show so we separate out the costs from the accumulated depreciation to show the net book value. And the reason we do it this way is to give users of the accounts a sense of how old our assets are. And when we come along to looking at the balance sheets and uh, analyzing the balance sheets at some stage in the future, you'll know that the older the assets are, the more likely you're gonna need cash flow to buy new assets. So the reason we set up the notes to the accounts in this way is to give us a hint as to how old our assets are by looking at what the accumulated depreciation is relative to the cost. So if your accumulated depreciation, so I'll explain this. So in the, in the section that we have, we always start off with the balance as at the beginning of the period. I'm gonna start with the previous year. So in the previous year, we started off with nothing. We bought our assets for 120,000 pounds and we ended the year with a cost of 120,000 pounds. 
again, we had no accumulated depreciation at the beginning of the previous period. We depreciated last year 24,000 pounds. So the accumulated depreciation is still 24,000 pounds. We've got net assets, net book value of 96,000 pounds. So in this year, we start off with the same 120,000 pounds we ended off last year as costs. We didn't buy anything new. So we still got costs of 120,000 pounds at the end of the period. But the, with depreciation, we've added a further 24,000 pounds. So we've now got 48,000 pounds of accumulated cost or 72,000 pounds of net book value. So already, if you're analyzing these accounts, you can get a feel for how likely it is you're going to have to spend money on buying new fixed assets. And in the year 2022, the answer is not that likely because we've still got quite a healthy net book value relative to the shop fitting of the total costs. So that's the statutory reporting. So far, so good. But I want to show you a potential problem with the basic premise I gave you in the shop fittings, which is that you simply, the shortcut is you simply take whatever the total retained cost is of your fixed assets and multiply them by 20%. You do that each year, it's a shortcut. But this is a problem I want to identify for you. In this example, we bought the fittings. So this is the nominal ledger. We bought these fittings for 120,000 pounds. At the end of the first year, we allocated depreciation, depreciation of 24,000 pounds. We're down to 96,000 pounds. Then we allocate depreciation in the next year of 24,000 pounds. We allocate depreciation in the following year of 24,000 pounds. And look what happens when we get to the um, fifth year, 2025, we've depreciated all of the 120,000 pounds. There's nothing left in the cumulative balance. But if we don't keep track of this net figure, look what we do in the following year. If we simply allocate 20% uh, 20 of the 120,000 pounds, in the following year, we allocate another 20%, 20 and then the following year, another 20%, and we're down into negative territory. And what we're doing is we're allocating costs to the profit and loss account that don't exist. So we're actually making a mistake if we account for it. Now, if this is the only transaction, it'll be very obvious that that's what you're doing. And you, you, you wouldn't need anyone to tell you that you would stop after the end of this year because your fixed assets figure would go negative. But what happens if in this year, in the third year, we buy another 40,000 pounds of assets? So we bought 40,000 pounds of assets. Look what's happened. Uh, sorry. I've We bought 40,000 pounds of assets. Our depreciation has gone up to 32,000 pounds. But look what happens at the end of year five. We, if you remember, that was the year in which our fixed assets had gone to zero. But at the moment, we've still got 16,000 pounds of fixed assets. And we're now gonna put through a further depreciation charge in the following year of 32,000 pounds. But wait, that 32,000 pounds, represents both depreciation on the 40,000 pounds, but also 40, uh, depreciation on the 120,000 pounds, which is now fully depreciated. So in this year, we're over depreciating and we don't see it. At the end of the year, it looks like we've got a cumulative balance of 16,000 pounds. We wouldn't know that we've over depreciated. So that's the potential problem. Again, let me just remove that. No, if we haven't got any purchases, it's very obvious at the end of this year that we need to stop. We need to stop depreciating 120,000 pounds. But if we put, if we put some purchases in, in during the period, at the end of that, at the end of the fifth year, we're not down to zero. So we're not triggered that we should stop depreciating the 120,000 pounds 
And indeed, we've, we, we wrongly allocate depreciation in that year. So what's the solution? The solution is to use something called a fixed assets register. A fixed asset register distinguishes each asset that you've got. So if you've got a car, you distinguish that from a fittings. But if you buy two different types of fittings, you would distinguish one from the other. So in this case, we bought some fittings in 2020. Uh, our designer might have thought we need to spruce up what we're doing and have a new set of purchase, a new set of uh, a different type of fittings in part of the store in 2023. So the way we account for this is in our register, we, dis we, we keep track of our cost and our depreciation separately and our net book value. So our net book value is simply the difference between the cost and the depreciation each year. But look now, so and at the end of this, at the end of year five in 2025, it's very obvious we have to stop depreciating from then onwards. But look what happens when we now pay by our 40,000 pounds in the following year, our register is separated. This 40,000 pounds doesn't go into our first register. It goes into the second register, the 2023 purchases. And we've got our depreciation schedule relative to that. And we can see that at the end, we need to stop depreciating at the end of 2020, at the end of 30, uh, 2027. So because we know we've got to zero, we would simply delete this. But look what happens with this depreciation for 2026. If you remember when we over depreciated it, we were going to depreciate at 16,000 pounds. But when we've solved the, pro solved the problem, we've stopped depreciating the first lot because we fully depreciated it. We only depreciate the second purchase of 8,000 pounds and our depreciation schedule now gives us the correct figure. So using a fixed asset register, this is the way we can avoid the error of combining assets and fully depreciating one and going on depreciating it because we've mistakenly mixed it with another set of assets. Now, for reasons you may be able to work out, this doesn't apply if you use the reducing balance basis because with the reducing balance basis, you actually never finish depreciating. Let's just have a quick look at that. Um, if you remember, this is the original chart on the reducing balance basis. The reason you never fully depreciate is because you only ever depreciate based on the percentage of what you started off with. So as long as you never start off with a negative figure, your depreciation is always going to be less than what you start off with. So you can never depreciate, fully depreciate your assets. Okay, so fixed asset register and on computerized accounting, most of them have their own means of helping you keep track of fixed assets using their own register. That's why we keep a register. You don't need to do so if you're using the reduced balance basis, but if as most people do, you're using the fixed rate cost, which is much easier, much more instinctive and much more understandable, then you want to use a register to avoid over depreciating if you need to. And remember the idea of all these manual adjustments, manual calculations rather, is to allow us to put the journal through into the accounts through either the trial balance by way of journal or in the computer accounts in order to get the allocation of the costs into the correct accounting year. So I'm now gonna come through a second issue with fixed assets. And that's what happens if you sell the assets. So I'm gonna go back to uh, the shop fittings. And at the end of the third year, we've depreciated three lots of years. Our net balance show We've got unallocated costs still of 48,000 pounds. We started off at 120,000 pounds. We've apportioned 72,000 pounds to the profit loss account. We've got 48,000 pounds carried forward of unapportioned costs. And if you look at the register, you can see these figures here show the same figures. What happens at the end of the third year if we sell the assets? Well, if we sell the assets for 48,000 pounds, we don't really have much of a problem. We've got a bit of a problem, which I'll explain in a minute. 
but we don't have a huge problem because we're getting exactly what the cumulative balance was in the accounts. But it's very, very rare that you predict accurately what the sales price of assets will be at the beginning of when you purchase the asset. It's very difficult to know what it, the price will be when you sell it. You have to guess or estimate. And in this particular case, our estimate was that we'd have 48,000 pounds of unapportioned costs at the end of 20th of, uh, at the end of uh, 2023, when actually on the 31st of December, someone comes along and says, I'm going to buy your fixtures for 40,000 pounds. And if our designer has had enough of a, a go at us and say, we have to update the fittings in our store, we need to change our image. We may well say, okay, I'm going to sell the assets for 40,000 pounds. Frankly, it's better than I worried about. If I don't sell them, I've got to throw them away. So I'm better off to sell them for 40,000 pounds than nothing. The problem is, how do you account for the fact that we've got unallocated costs of 48,000 pounds, but we're only, those assets are now only worth 40,000 pounds? And the answer is, we split the transaction into two. The first part of it is, we're going to remove the cost and the accumulated depreciation from our accounts. So we're going to put in an entry. Uh, let me just move this out of the way. We're going to put in an entry, 31 December, sale of assets. And I'm going to put in a negative figure of 48,000 pounds. And that reduces the cumulative balance to zero. And again, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to show my sales, but this time, instead of showing minus 48,000 pounds, I'm going to split it between the cost and the depreciation. I'm going to reduce my cost by 120,000 pounds. And my accumulated depreciation, I'm going to remove 72,000 pounds of that to come back to zero. So as I said, what I've done with the sale in my register, I've reduced my cost by 120,000 pounds. I've removed it. I've also removed the depreciation. So I have removed 48,000 48, pounds of, of net book value from my, from my nominal accounts. And I want to show you what that looks like on the trial balance. On the trial balance, we started off at the beginning of 2023 with 72,000 pounds. We depreciated 24,000 pounds, but now the whole of the 48,000 pounds that we've got left is no longer an asset, it's no longer to be carried forward. So we need to reduce the assets by 48,000 pounds. And if we look back at the register, that 48,000 pounds represents cost of 120,000 pounds and depreciation of 72, accumulated depreciation of 72,000 pounds. And if we had two um, uh, accounts instead of one on here, if one was shop fittings and another line was shop fittings accumulated depreciation, we show those two figures separately. In this, I've just lumped them together. But correctly, at the end of the period, we're showing got no, no cost left that are unallocated because we've sold the cost, we sold the assets. And look, we're showing in our bank account that we've received 40,000 pounds. So here's a challenge. We've received 40,000 pounds, but in our books, our books showed 48,000 pounds. We've lost 8,000 pounds, or more technically, we've got 8,000 pounds of costs that we bought when we first purchased the asset that we still haven't allocated to profits, but yet we've got no more assets to carry forward. We're not gonna be using those assets against future revenues, What's the other entry, the other double entry? So we debit bank, because that's the money that goes into our bank. We credit fixed assets of 48,000 pounds because we eliminate the cost of 48,000 pounds that had been in there. We reduce it to zero. Debit bank 40,000 pounds. Credit, uh, credit um, shop fittings of 48,000 pounds. We've got 8,000 pounds of debit we still have to allocate? The answer is we allocate it 
to the same place we allocate depreciation. So we debit the profit and loss account, that 8,000 pounds is treated as a loss in the current year. Now, if you could go back in time, you would say, look, that 8,000 pounds should actually be spread over the three years equally, but we've already accounted for the first two years, so it's too late. So the best we can do is write off the difference in the current year. So even though if you look at the three years as a whole, we have this big hit to our profits of 8,000 pounds in the current year, that's simply the way the cookie crumbles. It's because we've already allocated all the costs and we have to now release the balance. Conversely, if we received 50,000 pounds instead of 40,000 pounds, that 8,000 pounds cost would have become a 2,000 pounds profit. So it can go either way. What we're doing is we're releasing any unapportioned costs or revenues, of course, to the profit and loss account in the year in which it happens. So in this case, our total cost to the profit and loss account was 32,000 pounds, of which 24,000 was depreciation and 8,000 pounds was the, um, the loss on the sale of fixed assets. The final thing I want to do is to show you what that looks like when you're reporting it. So when we're reporting it in the accounts, we show 120,000 pounds brought forward, or per, uh, start again. Our costs of 100, the, our cost at the beginning of the period of 120,000 pounds. We've got no purchases. We have a new line in the cost section saying sale of fixed assets in the year. And in this case, we sold 120,000 pounds, which brings our cost to zero. And in our depreciation, we started off with accumulated depreciation of 48,000 pounds. We had a further 24,000 pounds of depreciation in the year. We've now sold fixed assets. The sale eliminates that 72,000 pounds, which leaves us with no accumulated depreciation at the end of the period. Our net book value is down to zero. So that brings us to the end of the fixed assets module. Um, I hope you understood a lot of the concepts of them. It's actually much more straightforward when you're doing it. I spent quite a long time describing it because I wanted you to understand the principles, the principles by which you can allocate the costs to the period in which the revenues relate to those costs. And I was illustrated that there's more than one way of allocating the cost, depending on what you think suits the business best. We've been through how you put that through the accounts and how you record them and how you report them in the statutory accounts and to management if you need to do so. So thank you for listening. Keep well. Bye.